In this video, we're going to cover the stride option. You know that lingering question from the last video of how do we cut the resolution in half from the input to the output? This is going to answer that. So far, in all of our examples of convolution, our filter window has moved by just one pixel at a time. But that distance is actually configurable with the stride setting. For example, a really popular choice is to use a stride of 2, which moves the window by 2 pixels at a time. You can see that here. Now, to help illustrate this, I'll put a marker at the center of the filter window each time it stops. This will help you see the big picture of what's going on with the stride, and also you'll be able to see the effect of changing the stride at a glance by just looking at all of the markers rather than sitting here and watching the whole animation each time. I'll stop the animation here after we've covered the entire spatial area with the filter window, and I just want you to make a note of what the pattern of markers looks like. Because now we're going to generate a new pattern using the stride of one that we've been using in all of my previous videos. Now I'll put the two different patterns side by side so that you can compare them. And you can see with the stride of one, we stop at every row and column in the entire spatial area, where with the stride of two, we're stepping over every other row and every other column. Just keep that in mind for now, but it's going to be important later. Let's look at a few more examples of stride. And from now on, I'm just going to show you the final pattern after covering the entire spatial area. Now we're looking at a stride of three. So from one marker to the next, we're moving three pixels, which is leaving a gap of two pixels wide in the rows and columns. And the pattern continues on from there, going up to higher strides. I'm not going to show anything higher than a stride of four, because I've never seen anything higher than a stride of four in a real world network. And even that is incredibly rare. Back to our toy example, I want you to notice how the resolution of the output matches the number of markers that we have on screen. Larger strides cause fewer filter window stops and a smaller output. Smaller strides cause many more stops and a larger output. So using a stride greater than one is an effective way to significantly reduce the output resolution. Of course, this isn't the only way to reduce the spatial resolution of a feature map. There are other layers that can do that too. But usually after downsampling, you're going to follow that with a convolution. So it's often just more efficient to do the convolution while you're doing the downsampling. And that's what makes using a stride of two a popular choice. Now I'll point out that you can have a different stride for different spatial axes. I'll show a few examples of that here, but I've never seen that done in practice. It's hard to even think of a theoretical reason why you might want to do that. I only mention it here because now I can say that we've covered the basics of stride. But wait, before you go off adding stride randomly to your neural networks, let's talk about a few best practices. First off, if you choose a stride bigger than your kernel size, you're going to end up skipping over pixels completely. Here in this example, we've got a kernel size of 3x3, three three, and we're going to look at a stride of 4. And you'll see that the kernel moved so far that it left an entire column that was never covered by the kernel in any part of the calculation. That means that the output feature map is not going to depend on those pixels at all. Those will become completely irrelevant to the final output, which is not a situation you want to be in. Presumably, you spent the time calculating those pixels in the input feature map for a reason and they contain useful information, and you would like that information to, in some way, influence the output feature map. So, this is bad. Generally, you don't want to use a stride bigger than your kernel size. Now, if you're sticking to strides of 1 and 2, then the only time that you're going to get into this situation is if you're using a stride of 2 with a kernel size of 1. And I would like to say that you should never do that, but I can actually think of a few situations where you might want to. For example, if you've got a residual network and you're downsampling, then your shortcut connection is also going to have to downsample, and you typically use a kernel size of 1 to do anything with the shortcut connection. And, you know, maybe if you're doing that, you should blur the input feature map first so that all the data is taken into account even though you're using a stride of 2 with a kernel size of 1. However, in a residual network, the main branch is going to use all the data in its calculation regardless because it's using 3x3 kernels. So, it's not a big deal. The point is, in the shortcut branch, you're going to end up taking a stride of 2 with a kernel size of 1, so, you know, it's not completely evil. Just make sure that you have a good reason 
or know why it's not going to cause you to lose data when you take a stride of two with a kernel size of one. And speaking of losing data, that brings us to another best practice, padding. Let's take a look at what can happen if you don't use padding. Here we've got a stride of two with a kernel size of three, and you'll notice that something happens when we get to the end of the row. We've got one column remaining, but we're taking strides of two. We can't step two more spaces, we can only step one more space. So what does the convolution algorithm do? Well, it just moves on to the next row and ignores that last column. It just skips over it instead. That data is lost the same as it was when we took strides that were too big for our kernel size. Now, this doesn't always happen, and it's not that simple to figure out whether or not it's going to happen. You'll notice in this example that the last row is not skipped over like the last column was. That's because we've got a different number of columns than rows, and that input size is one of the factors that determines whether or not this is going to happen, along with the size of your stride and the size of your kernel. But regardless of all that, there's one simple way to fix the problem every time, and that is to use padding. Let's add some padding and try that again. This is the same amount of padding that you would use if you were using the padding mode of same, but we'll talk more about that in a second. For now, let's just look at how padding affects our previous problem. You'll notice that we're still skipping over that last column. We didn't change anything there, but now that last column that we're skipping over is just padding. So we're not losing any real data. All of the legitimate data from our input is still being used to calculate the output. And if that doesn't convince you to use padding, there's another reason why you're going to want to. Remember back to our architecture that we went over in the filter count video and how we cut the resolution exactly in half? Yes, we're finally going to answer that. If we go back to our example without padding, you'll notice that the resolution isn't being cut in half like that. It's actually slightly smaller than we want. We saw this problem before in the padding episode, so you can probably guess what the solution is. It's to add padding with a value of same or at least the equivalent of it. In TensorFlow, you can actually pass in a padding of same when you've got a stride of two. Even though the output isn't going to be the same size as the input, TensorFlow knows what you mean and it will pad accordingly. PyTorch is a little bit more nitpicky. You have to have a stride of one to pass in a padding of same since technically the output size won't be the same without a stride of one. So you've got to put in the padding values manually. But if you're sticking to a kernel size of three by three, then it's pretty simple just to remember to add one pixel padding to each side. Unfortunately, the general case requires doing quite a bit of math. You've got to solve this equation for the padding term, and I'm not gonna cover this equation in this video. I'll cover it later in another video on the math behind convolution, but you can cover almost every case that you run into in practice by just remembering that with the kernel size of three by three, you want to add one pixel of padding, and with the kernel size of one by one, you don't need to add padding at all. And with that being said, we've now covered not only stride, but all the popular settings for convolution. In the next few videos, I'll talk about some of the more exotic options and ways to perform convolution. Thanks for watching.